Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, Canadians with Disabilities and Their Allies. My name is Brent. I'm the host for the show. And today I have Vivica Ellis from Single Mothers Alliance joining me. Hello, Vivica. Welcome to the show. Hello, Brent. It's lovely to be here. I have to apologize again because it just changed the window size again. Bear with me, everyone. So you can see the wonders of uh, live thing. It just reset all the windows again. And I didn't do anything. This is, why I, this is why I love it. it Thanks was, for troubleshooting, Neil. It, 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 it was perfect. Um, this is pretty good. I think I'm just going to leave it like that. It looks pretty good now. OK. Right. Yeah. We're, well, we're thanks. Uh, thanks uh -huh. for uh, thanks for joining me, Vivica. It's always a great pleasure having uh, having you uh, join on, and um, yeah, this is great. And uh, so, uh, Vivica, uh, thanks um, thanks again for for uh, coming on. And tell me uh, tell me about uh, a little bit about your background, about your advocacy. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for for having myself and the Single Mothers Alliance here today. I was really excited. Um, when when you reached out and Neil reached out because we go way back um, to yeah. the end of clawback yeah. days and um, I guess what I could could start by a, a little brief intro to the Single Mothers Alliance um, we founded in 2014 um, after oh. a long decade of lack of investment in our social safety net and income and disability assistance housing um, and radical cuts in this province under a different government. So at that time, I had my own lived experience um, of some challenges around relationship breakdown, housing, access to legal aid, um, child care, and my own experience of income assistance. And I took a look around and I thought, this is ridiculous. Why are thousands and thousands of British Columbians in this wealthy, beautiful province of ours living so far below the poverty line? Um, mm -hmm. not able to feed their children in inadequate housing, not accessing the basic things that they need, um, access to justice and family law, child care so that they could work decent wages with benefits higher than the very low minimum wage we had back then. So I banded together uh, with some other single mothers at the time. And um, we decided that we wanted to build an organization that would build, I suppose, for lack of a better term, social capital for single mothers. The majority mm -hmm. of single parents in the province, um, there's gender diversity 100%, but there's a large proportion that are female led. Um, and they are in quite great depths of poverty for a very com complexity of reasons to do with their identity and their experience. So we wanted to start an organization that would build an alliance and a network of women so that we could work past the social isolation of, of poverty and, and those hardships. You feel so alone. Um, so we wanted to find each other um, and then just focus 100% on advocacy and mobilizing and building community to advocate for a BC that supports the people who need to be supported the most. So yeah. that's where we started way back when and we're still around today. That's great. Yeah, yeah network. And and I just wanted to say that you and I did hook up. At, it was in uh, 2014, so ba ba basically right when right when uh, Single Mothers Alliance was just getting off the ground is when you and I hooked up. And um, you know, I was really excited to partner with you guys because um, you know I'm very very passionate about the the clawbacks and that and how it was affecting me. And and uh, when when you and I talked talked on the phone last week or whenever it was. Um, you know, one one of the things I told you is uh, I have a real affinity for it. like there's some of the best um, grassroots advocacy is from pissed off uh, mothers. You know, and mm -hmm. and um, you know I, I say that I say that with all sincerity because I can say that because like my own mother was like that too, right? Because when you have a son or daughter with a with a disability especially like in my, like I'm almost 55 now. And so 55 years ago or, or thereabouts, I mean, um, there was just so much uh, unknown when it came to disability. Like I have cerebral palsy and 
like 55 years ago, it was like I was a guinea pig. Like the doctors didn't really even know what cerebral palsy was. And and so my mom was always having to really advocate hard uh, when, and she would always push back with, with against the doctors and say, this is, you know, because the doctors would say, you know, don't expect anything from your son. Your son's not going to be able to do anything. He's going to be a, a, you know, an idiot, basically his whole life kind of thing, because they would, they would equate disability with, you know, some kind of cognitive uh, disability as well. Right. And so my mom would always be pushing back all the time. And um, it helped that she was a nurse. Like she, she was a nurse her whole life. And so she was very confident with, with pushing my back on the doctors all the time and saying, this is, this is bull. I don't, I don't believe what you're telling me. And so that's what I mean about, you know, it takes some pissed off mothers sometimes to really, really get some action. And so I, I that's why I really appreciated, uh, you know, hooking, hooking up with you guys, like I said, back in 2014. I, I recall that very well, Neil. Um, I believe we met on commercial drive and, and we had coffee and we talked yeah. and, um, you know, I appreciate it so much at that time. We were organizing, you know, among women and but but working alongside so many allies. And and since then and all along, we've seen you as a huge ally in disability advocacy reform and the clawbacks. And I think you you carried on the torch and ended other clawbacks mm -hmm. after the end of the clawback that we'll discuss more in depth here. So, yeah. you know, um, yeah, it was fantastic to to accomplish something back then with, as you say, right, that grassroots mobilizing that was taking place. And there were mm -hmm. so many involved. We were one of the players and we, maybe we can talk more about that too, but yeah, yeah it was lovely to, to feel that synergy back then, right? And get together and about when it comes to angry mothers or motivated mothers, 100%, yeah. you yeah. know, Vancouver has a really rich history of, of mother activism. And I think of um, yeah, it's really exciting to to tap into the the energy and the fierceness that yeah. can come with mother and, and parent and caregiver. Well, it really was it really was um, you know going back uh, eight or nine years. That really was a watershed moment when you when you uh, won, it, like you actually won against the provincial government. Uh, you know the, the courts sided with the Single Mothers Alliance and said yes. This is this is bad. Uh, the government shouldn't be doing this. I mean, that to me, like it was such a watershed moment. And so uh, I want you to take us back to to that moment where when the Single Mothers Alliance uh, won and, and what went into that, what went into that, uh, uh, like how how did you defend that and how did the, how did that argument play out in court? Right. Well, you know, it, it was interesting because we ended up withdrawing the lawsuit, right? And then they ended it in the BC budget, which was even, which was a really exciting outcome that we were expecting then. Oh. Um, but to go back into it, so the, the end the clawback campaign, we, we found it in 2014. And um, when we found it, what we found right away was these incredibly inspiring mother activists. Um, and other allies that were already organizing and they were really leading the way with the end the clawback campaign. Um, they were mothers associated with BC Acorn. BC Acorn okay. played a huge role. They were they, very good they, too. Yeah. They started that campaign basically. That was, mm -hmm. there were some very, very smart, tenacious mothers organizing with BC Acorn and BC Acorn is incredible. I mean, they mobilize, mm -hmm. they're fierce, um, and they win, they win. <laughs> um, yeah. And they're, because they're so grassroots, they're going for things that really matter for people. Um, mm. So there were these mothers organizing with BC Acorn. Um, and I recall, I think it was in 2014, there was this fantastic, um, so there's BC Acorn. And then what had happened was first call child and youth um, uh, advocacy coalition, the poverty yeah. reduction coalition, and then Michelle Mungal who was at yeah, that yeah. time the yeah. opposition critic for social yeah. development with the NDP, Michelle Mongol and this sort of ad hoc coalition mm -hmm. of grassroots activists, established organizations, coalition, lots of other organizations at the table. And I don't want to forget to name anybody. There were so many. I was, I worked with uh, First Call as well. I, did, I was oh, part did. of their campaign for, I think two years that they ran with my story. I, yeah, I, knew I remember that. Yeah. I knew yeah, Michelle so Mungal really well, actually. Yeah. I uh, did a lot of advocacy with her, too. But this, this is, is where amazing. this is where we can start, um, you know, being a little bit truthful. And and 
this is where I kind of get upset though, is because uh, let's remember back before uh, the NDP took government uh, in, in, in the lead up to 2017 election, mm -hmm. there was so many uh, MLAs, um, Michelle Mungle being one of them, and even, um, you know, Premier Horgan. Um, and, and um, you know, I had uh, Harry Baines, who is the MLA in my in my area, uh, Newton here. And I, I went and spoke with him, like I was actually right across his desk, like we were literally inches apart. And, um, and he said, Oh, yeah, for sure, we're gonna, we're gonna end all clawbacks. Um, like, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's for sure gonna be, that's, that's gonna be our number one thing. And everybody was saying it, everybody, it wasn't just, it wasn't just one, one MLA, it was Michelle Mungo, it was, it was Harry Baines, it was um, John Horgan, like everybody across the board. It, that was one of their big platforms. And they were like pumping it, like they were really pumping it hard on the dis dis disability community. We're gonna do this, we're gonna, we're gonna erase the clawbacks. And then what happened? <laughs> they didn't, they, did. they, did, they didn't do it. <laughs> they all so, kept saying, don't worry, we have your back, right? <laughs> you know, and that's one of the things they love to say, we have your back, we have your back. And yet then they, then they take the knife and they stab you in the back with it, you know, and they, you know, that's what, and so that's what I want to talk about now is like every month, like it's an, it's a new, it's a new thing for me every month where every time they're, they're still taking away almost, it's like $480 or $500 a month. They're still clawing back. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they, re, they respected, um, my son's portion, like, um, we can, to go back again and talk about, you know, yeah. when, when you guys won uh, against your clawbacks, um, they weren't originally going to do anything for um, survivors pensions. Mm -hmm. And um, so then I got the help of, I got the help of um, Sam Sullivan, who was a, mm -hmm. who was the liberal MLA at the time. And he really pushed hard. He got a big, huge target on his back for, for taking my, like there were so many people in his own party that were gunning for him. Like I, I really appreciate. Like you really get to appreciate the amount of, um, just the amount of mechanizations that's going on behind the scenes. And he took a lot of slings and arrows for me. A lot, a lot of slings and arrows. And like I said, originally they weren't going to do it. And I said, you know, and then, and then I pointed back to to Single Mothers Alliance. I said, well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, the court just decided that this was a bad thing, and you're you're gonna say that it doesn't count uh, for um, it doesn't count for uh, you know uh, for survivors pensions and things like that. And and finally, they said, oh, well, I guess so. And and but it was only because Sam Sullivan pushed, and it was me pushing. And he actually told me like point blank. He said, you know, if I don't get back to you within three days, like we'd always. He would always really text me all the time. He's been saying, you know, if I don't get back to you in three days, like bug me again. And, and so I would take him on his word and I would keep bugging, bugging him. And I would say, how's it going? <laughs> you know, and he would be really, um, really uh, forthright and honest with me and say, uh, you know, I'm not hearing anything from, from up above. And like, he would just say they're, they're really getting quiet. And right, right then I knew I mean, the reason why they're, why they're getting quiet is that, you know, <laughs> they got their hand caught in the cookie jar and they kind of know. Right. And impact so, on. so there was a lot of crap that was going on behind the scenes. And like I said, uh, Sam Sullivan took a lot of slings and arrows for me. And but that wouldn't have happened if uh, Single Mothers Alliance didn't kind of uh, push down the first dot domino. Right. All the dominoes kind of fell. Um, but yep. there again, if we go back to 2015, like if we have to go forward a bit, there was things that didn't change. Yeah. Um, because they, they said they were going to erase all of the callbacks and they didn't. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, sorry, yeah. Brian, did you? It, and, and that's part of, um, like, um, deep, um, policies, right? It's all policy driven and it's like so archaic policies that, the, a lot of it doesn't matter who's in government. They seem to be so stubborn. They don't want to change it because the status quo, it seems to work. And 
well, yeah. you know, it's hard to keep changing them, but they keep amending it, you know, keep uh, redacting certain things and look what we've done. Look what we've done. Well, that's yeah. not good enough. They need to change and stop all clawbacks altogether. Yeah. 100%. So, you know, my mind's racing around while you're speaking, Neil and, and Brent, too, because, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to the strategy. So we, we came on the scene. There were these amazing mothers, BC Acorn, the other organizations, Michelle Mongol, this ad hoc coalition. Neil, you were in there. Um, and then, you know, we came in as this organization that was founding sort of in this environment. And it was sort of a surprising environment to find us in. But of course, we dove in mm -hmm. um, uh, because that that had impacted me. The clawback had impacted me right. uh, directly, um, and I knew exactly what they were talking about. Um, so yeah. we came in, and I'm just thinking, you know, to speak to so much of what you said, right? So we had, I'm just thinking of the the strategy that was shared by insiders in government at that time. Why the clawback? Mm -hmm. um, and why, because obviously we need so many reforms, and we still do, and we'll get to the topic of current government and what isn't done and what was promised and what needs to be done and, and lighting mm -hmm. that fire right yeah. now 100 i think we have to to keep you know keep going 100 but the question was sort of you know we we needed so much so many things had been cut the the rates didn't go up though we ended the clawback of child support mm -hmm. the rates didn't go up they hadn't been raised in a very long time um but i remember this strategy discussion where it was like okay we're so far behind um the the members of the opposition that that were collaborating on this and supporting community um, they were like, well, why don't, you know, if we all go for one thing and make a big point through that one piece, right? So through this one cruel piece of legislation, we can show the near, like kind of the brutality of the system that, that mm. legislates poverty, that claws back dollar for dollar money from uh, people who are already living far below the poverty line. So it, it was kind of a, in a way, it was a, a handy way of revealing all of the other pieces. But I feel like the strategy trade off there is we need a basket, right? We need the whole basket of fruit. So if we mm -hmm. focus on winning one apple or one banana yeah. um, and you can make build a really big campaign and then that seems mm -hmm. affordable to government and then, like, OK, finally, we got this win. Um, but that doesn't mean then do they have license to just ignore the basket of fruit that we need or to turn yeah. their back and say, oh, well, yeah. we gave you an apple. So what are yeah. you asking for a whole fruit basket now? Um, but I think at that time under the government that we had, the current situation, it did the, the, the end to the clawback of child support. So when you were on income or disability assistance, right, and then the other parent was court ordered or would voluntarily give you the child support government would claw that back dollar for dollar yeah. mm -hmm. and so what would the the challenge the angle that we took with the the charter challenge that we launched which was eventually let go of when they mm. did end it um was that it was the right of the child the right of children mm -hmm. being raised by people on income or disability assistance to the income of the other parents so we were taking this children's rights approach which you know mm. and then um BC Acorn and others, there were sort of angry mothers on the steps of the legislature with these really impactful rallies. And we had a Mother's Day poverty potluck, I remember. I think I remember um, that, yeah. Right, yeah. it was great. They had yeah. um, outside a, um, a MLA's office out in New West, I believe. Um, and it was all the, the, the mothers brought um, food from the food bank that they had to feed their kids. And they're saying, look, my kid could have had access to four or $500 more this month and I wouldn't have had to go to the food bank. And I could have gone and bought fresh apples and chicken and not fed them this expired can, you know, high sodium junky can that they got at the food bank. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was so great to see those mothers organizing because all the cameras were there. And it was like, they were, they were managing to really funnel a lot of media attention. So I was just thinking as you were speaking, Neil, about these, these, the strategy behind campaigns that we run and the trade-offs and the sometimes the unintended impacts. Because now I would advocate for a whole suite of all the clawbacks to end. And then we say, start with this one. But yeah. we don't take the heat off all of them. But back then we were so focused on that one. It's really mm -hmm. great that we snuck in the child death benefit. Yeah. Uh, and to yeah. the clawback that you really accomplished there, yeah. Yeah. Sam Sullivan and, and others, but really there were so many more. Oh, yeah. and, and and one of the things I mean, you you were oh, talking okay. about you were talking about baskets of fruit earlier, and um, I just want to jump on that analogy because um, you know the fact that, um, like I said, that you 
that the Single Mothers Alliance won against the clawback and the provincial government said that clawbacks are bad, except they're like cherry picking still because they're saying, well, well, this this is bad, according to the provincial courts, but but this we're going to cherry pick this and say that, you know, uh, the bulk of my survivor's pension, the one that the one that uh, is is tagged for me as as the parent, like my son's portion is respected, but my portion is disrespected. And it's like, how does that make sense? Because I'm still the parent and it's still money that I'm using to support my son. I mean, of course the government knows that, right? It's like, if they, and I mean, they should. I mean, it's, they, it's like, there's not a line in the sand saying, here's the portion for your son. And here's a line that says, this money doesn't belong to you anymore. We're gonna disrespect it. And the, you know, and the thing that goes along with that too, is I think a lot of people don't realize how much um, legislation and law there is in place about in uh, the Ministry of Labor, for example, um, there's so much legislation that talks about um, protecting uh, pensions. Like there's so much like protect the pension, protect the pension, protect the pension at all costs. And yet, you know, you have the Ministry of Social Development saying, let's not respect the pension, let's claw it back. And it's like, are you kidding me? So you have all this legislation saying, let's protect the pension. And you have another ministry that's just, you know, willy nilly, like, let's just disrespect it, you know? And well, well, here, well, here's and another thing too, Neo is, uh, and uh, Vivica is, when COVID was full blown, right? Um, I'm sure maybe you might have uh, been following it. I know Neil knows about this. Is that and and any of the listeners watching, uh, like listening right now, is when COVID came in, the provincial government, the minister of the of the day, um, came out with a uh, a supplement to help people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. It changed their lives in so many ways because they were able to buy healthy food, right? They're able to take care of their families, their children. Uh, single mothers, right? We're able to provide more um, clothing. They could go and buy clothing to buy whatever they needed for or a COVID supplement at the time, right? So, but the, the but the government said, well, they were going to do it in increments every three months. They were going to review it, see how it was going. Uh, they they kept extending it. So everybody in the disability community uh, and some of my neighbors at the time, some single mothers at the time, were like, yeah, I mean, this is great because we can actually live. Like like, yay, we finally get a, a huge increase. But it soon became reality that uh, that increase was not going to be permanent. And the minister yeah. got a real blowback on that one uh, from media saying, well, why, why would you give it? And now, now you're thinking about maybe yeah. taking it away. So they kept it going until December, uh, December 31st of 2000. And I'll have to think back here, <laughs> 2021. Right. So uh, then they said, OK, you're, it'll be on your final check in December. So uh, January, February, March, uh, they said they were going to then discontinue it and in March. Media came out, interviewed me. Uh, they were right on right where I lived. They had the cameras right there rolling, you know, and asking me, my manager staying from a distance and saying, you know, you know, saying, well, how would this impact you, Brent? How would this impact your life? I go, if they take it away, I have to move because my rent is so high. I'm paying high market rent. So I'm going to have to sacrifice and move to somewhere else. I don't know where that would be. So, uh, you and know, you did which, move. Yeah. And, and yeah. So yeah. what they did was the government, oh, okay. Well, instead of the 300, they gave back 175 of it. Yeah. So, yeah. and that was back then. And here's the amazing part. Uh, BC poverty reduction put out a report on January 28th, 2021. Now that report wasn't released until then. And so this tells me that the government already knew way back what their plans were. But they re re basically released this report out on January 28th of 2021. And so in end of uh, March came, they said, okay, we're going to get back to 175 of the 300. Well, people started saying, well, wh why, why are they only giving back 175? Media even, the media even asked me, why would they only give back 175 of the 300? I go, I don't know. So fast forward to this budget of February 28th of 2023. Magically, that 125 came into place. 125 plus the 175, 300. Well, there you go. We gave back the money, but they didn't. They made it sound like it was a splashy announcement. Look what we're doing for the disabled community. However, 
that one said at 125 that they're going to be giving back in July 19th of this year. So you got to wait four more months before you get that increase. It only went to the shelter portion, which has right. been frozen for 15 years, 11 months, 15 years, 11 months. I mean, wow. For everyone watching and let that sink in for a minute, 15 years, 11 months. Uh, you know, you can't rent anywhere for market rent from that. So what the government did was they put that money to the shelter portion. So unfortunately, the ones who live in subsidized housing, they don't benefit from it at all. Yeah. Now, but they so it's cherry picking saying, mm -hmm. well, here, you live in market, you get this, you live in subsidized, you don't get that. And now people are outraged. I, and I get it. Like, that's not fair. It's dividing disabled against disabled. And again, so it's a clawback. Is a clawback, but then we're going to give with one hand back with the other one. They got to stop that. And it and, affects and, people's lives. And let's pause there for a moment because yeah. uh, you, you said something, Brent, without realizing what you said a little bit. Um, one of the things I was going to say first, though, is uh, there was also uh, that um, from the federal government, the federal government paid out $600 to some people with disabilities, remember? Right. Yeah, that's right. And, and so right, right there, you had you know, the federal government came up with the, the $2,000 CERB for everybody, right? Yeah. It's $2,000 a month for for a year. And, uh, oh, and by the way, uh, they came up with another one. It was $600 for one month, one payment, if you were disabled. And it's yeah. like, uh, there's a little bit of an equal equality difference there. Uh, yeah. And it's like, yeah. and it's like, why? It's like, just because you're disabled means that you're not, a person like you're some sort of less than that we we only deserve like 600 bucks and uh everybody else deserves two thousand dollars a month for for 12 months but we, we we get one payment of 600 bucks and that's good enough for you guys you know, know. and that, yeah. that's crazy and there's other thing you mentioned there uh brent is you talked you said uh the bc poverty coalition and i just want to stop there because i know you also worked with the bc poverty coalition yeah that's right yeah uh vivica and um and next week uh spoiler alert i'm having um the mm. bc poverty coalition on the show and i thought, thought i thought it was uh kind of a perfect to have both you yes. and 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 rowan on 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 the show uh because um you know so I was trying to tr track you down, Vivica, and I, I thought you were originally with. We uh, found uh, you. I thought you were you still. Did. I thought you were still with uh, the Poverty Coalition, and and uh, Rowan said, "Oh no, she's she's back with Single Moms Alliance." And oh, oh, really? Okay. So, um, so as a result of trying to track you down, <laughs> I also have Rowan on the show next week. Fantastic! Oh, that's yeah. Yeah. that's excellent. Yeah. Oh, they're up to a lot over there at the Poverty Reduction Coalition. I'm sure you'll mm -hmm. have a fantastic conversation. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, I was just thinking, I did, I had nearly five fantastic years at the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition and um, I absolutely loved it and I learned an enormous amount and worked with some of the, you know, very, you know, most committed, passionate uh, organizations and people representing them and activists and mobilizers and economists all focused on ending poverty in this province yeah. um and uh one thing led to another but the single mothers alliance we managed to sort of fund up in 2021 um mm -hmm. you know different grants came through and now after we were volunteer run and we remained purposefully sort of unfunded because we didn't feel we had the capacity for staff roles and i was working at the poverty reduction coalition with trish garner then oh, okay. um but then you know we sort of managed to yoke together some some various pieces of funding and so now I have a full-time job here and then three other staff so <laughs> that nice. was a long time coming but it happened and the pandemic kind of really led to that because projects were on hold and then there was this anyway it was just I had to come over here and and manage these the funding that we had mm -hmm. um and the poverty reduction coalition carried on but I was going to say Brent to what you were speaking to around the pandemic and enormous disparity between, you know, people who yeah. aren't accessing income and disability assistance or, uh, you know, getting the CERB and then that the sort of handout for people on disability that was, I thought, incredibly patronizing. And at, yeah. the, at the Poverty Reduction Coalition at the time, there were some really tenacious organizers with, uh, I think they had a campaign, 300 to Live. Do you remember? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 300 right. to Live. I was and at the campaign. Were, they were organizing, right, to keep the 300 and, and we were sort of in there supporting that th those yeah. folks who were mobilizing as best we could 
um, and advocating to government. I had, you know, talking to the minister, you've got to keep this 300. This is the groceries difference. Yep. I think that's what mm -hmm. 300 to live called it. Truly the food security difference. Yep. I mean, maybe now not so much considering inflation, but that yep. 300. Um, and then, so I just feel all of this speaks to the fact that we have so much more work to do around mm -hmm. destigmatizing those who access fixed incomes that they're on 1000% entitled to. And yeah. how it seems that yeah. like whether it's a, the previous government or this government, there's this fear that it's going to alienate voters if they spend more money on our yeah. welfare and disability yeah. support systems. And that's 100% not the case. So I think we still, you know, we have so much more. I feel like also the the relationship between the earnings exemption and the clawbacks, mm -hmm. you know, you can, yes, you can make $15,000 a year, but we're going to, in your case, Neil, claw back this $450. Yeah. Meanwhile, working is a very complex thing for many, mm -hmm. many, many people with yeah. physical or invisible disability. So I feel there's yeah. that stigma. Oh, you could have more money if you work and if you yeah. can't. Well, then we're going to still. This is what you get. Yeah. Punitive. Yeah. I feel and, it's punitive. And we have so much more work to do, which is why we love the allyship with. Yeah. yeah that's why, with. like, I was involved with the 300 to Live campaign. Um, and uh, when, when media put out the story uh, at a place I was living in, Langley at the time, and they came out and did a story and they put on the headline, uh, you know, uh, Brent and then they had my name, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, and, and, and in charge of the 300 to live campaign. I thought, no, I'm not the one who organized it. <laughs> the media kind of I always gets it wrong, like, right? There I are know, so many, thought, oh. they name one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they made it sound like, like I, I was the main one in charge of all this one. No, I'm helping them and I'm helping mm -hmm. as a as an ally to them to push the narrative. But what was good is that they, they took the lived experience that I said, like, what would happen? And they said, okay, well, I said, and I was looking at a brand new place that was getting built at the time. Like I was living in an old place that was really, it was mold and mildew. Like it was, it was not a good environment. So I thought, yay, I get to move to a new place because I got this $300. I can afford the rent. And it was devastating and I had to give it up. And then I moved to Victoria for a cheaper place. And at the time, that's not where I wanted to go, but uh, it was available at the time. I thought, yay, I've got more money to live, but it's not where I wanted to be. So and, you know, so again, you know, with governments making these uh, decisions that really like the rates were so suppressed for so many decades yeah. and then to take it away and then go, well, there you go. Oh, oh you want more? OK, well, we're going to raise the, <laughs> like, say, uh, Kelly mentioned the earnings exemption. Well, there you go. Yeah. You want it? OK, well, then go go get it. Right. Uh, yeah. It's like, no, it doesn't yeah. work that way. Yeah. yeah. I, wa I wanted to uh, go back to uh, your comments on stigma because. Mm. On previous shows, we've talked about it because um, I don't know if you recall, Vivica, but actually uh, the new um, minister, minister of social development for BC here, actually in her speech, she said the word stigma uh, almost in the same sentence about six times uh, when, when she was talking about the, the drug supply issue or the the you know the poison drug supply and she says mm -hmm. we must we must re remove the stigma of the poison drug supply stigma this stigma that stigma this and yet um there's no mention of stigma when when they're talking about people with disabilities it's like you know and and maybe this is gonna gonna sound like a bit of a reach but i don't know if you remember um well i mean it's, it's still an issue now but especially at the beginning of um the pandemic there was a mm -hmm. lot of um uh, racial hatred um mm. and a lot of discrimination with racial racial ha hatred right and actually um you know uh, sophie louis uh she's she's um she's one of the uh, reporters on uh global i think it is sophie mm -hmm. louis. Yeah, and cool. she was she was on twitter and she she said with all this social hate or with all this uh, hatred going going on with the pandemic uh she feels she said i feel othered and she was actually interviewed and talking talking about being othered, right? And she mm -hmm. used the term othered, right? And when she said that, and again, and I know I know it's talking about racial hatred, um, and you can say maybe this uh, disability discrimination is not quite the same thing. And I don't want to I don't want to minimize I don't want to minimize the racial part at all, mm -hmm. but but I'm just saying when she said othered, um, that struck a card chord to me because it's like that is what it's like to be on disability assistance because you're 
automatically othered all the time. Like the whole system, the whole s system of um, of income assistance is set up to be punishing and othering, and uh, the whole thing is systemically just broken. It's just systemically broken, and and we're all othered. We're all othered automatically. It's just like, you know what? You deserve this. You're othered, and. You know Anyone can become disabled at any time in their life. They can be born with a disability. They can be, and as they get older, they're going to develop more disabilities. And nobody should be treated differently because uh, they're because of their disability. They should not be discriminated or uh, you know racialized. Like yeah, you know, as like class as a classified as disabled. Like the problem is that the disability uh, programs across Canada and BC and across Canada, they're all. Um, blended into uh, legislated poverty uh, into like the, some people will call it welfare, some people call it income assistance, right? It's all blended into that same right. narrative and it shouldn't be, right? Yeah. It should not be, it should be a separate mm -hmm. division. And it's uh, a lot of people that if they have some kind of employment to declare, they, it says right there, have, have you been incar incarcerated, uh, you know, in prison? Like, really? Yeah. That's like, one of the well, first what, questions they ask is yeah, like, that's terrible. That's when, terrible. when's, When's the more your most recent uh, time in jail? You know, like, yeah. Like, uh, when's what? When's, when's your most recent arrest? You know, because yeah, that should be the top of mind question for all people with disabilities, right? It's yeah. like what? When were you last arrested? When were you? When were you last in jail? You know. And, and you yeah. know, this makes me think back around to you know your comments, Brent, about the 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 twenty twenty three budget and what we saw for the housing portion and no raise. We criticize that in our press release 100 percent front and center no raise mm -hmm. to the living allowance which with the cost yeah. of living going up with groceries being what yeah. they are yeah and that we're not going to stand in the streets clapping for that raise to the housing portion when that is they could have done that in 2017 2018 2019 right we've had many many years of of, of of government that has been promising as you say right so so we're going to say yes of course this is necessary but it's so little so late mm -hmm. um and i and i guess i i um i was thinking that you know when we think about the system you referred to neil right and how it is built now and i'd love to hear both of your thoughts on the canada disability benefit and an entirely new system that just yeah. eradicates this punitive fill out mm -hmm. the forms, tick the boxes um, system where, you know, you can earn, but you can't keep this. It's so complicated. It's ridiculous. It's stigmatizing mm -hmm. about like nearly 40 percent of the single mothers alliance members live on disability. So I I work directly and, 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 and such diversity in that group, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mental health, um, a lot of PTSD. Uh, yeah. from all forms of violence against women and domestic abuse um, and sexualized violence, uh, childhood sexual abuse, um, mental health disabilities, and, and, and all of the above. So I do hear and talk to an, a diversity of people. And it's almost like, as an organization, you know, how much energy are we going to put into changing this one little corner of this system now? We fought the end of the clawback that put money back in single parents' pockets. The reason that one was so loved, right? Because it actually, we still hear from mothers and <laughs> others who say, you know, oh my gosh, I could keep $2,000 in a lump sum. And then I got a yeah, car yeah. and then I got a job in the neighboring yeah. town yeah. because I can, and then now I'm not on income assistance anymore. That was a different situation. That was a mom on income assistance temporarily. Um, yeah. But, you know, these things, so they were worth fighting for, but now, you know, this, this whole scale renewal that we need, this bigger vision for switching out of this, like having a system that I feel violates the rights of people with disabilities every day, but in many, many, many ways, particularly through the legislated poverty. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on how sure. we can move past this this whole system and and how our allyship works towards this bigger better vision as opposed to you know putting so much energy into this little change and that little change and still having well this. um neo did you want me to go first on that i'll, I'll just you, give you, you a quick quick you summary can speak, you can speak okay. first on that yeah. okay so um right now as of today i was just actually just looking on to twitter here um <laughs> so those are wondering how many days it's been uh it's actually been uh whoops there we are 900 yeah. 903 days so far mm -hmm. since the uh, federal government announced 
the, the, uh, the, the Canada Disability Benefit, 903 days. So people have been waiting for any kind of help. Uh, there's been a lot of push, uh, people asking for a, an emergency uh, supplement. Uh, now, we, we call it DERB, right? It was like CERB, right? But it's DERB because it's for a disability. And nothing. Like the, uh, the finance minister said no. Like uh, she was asked uh, straight out, are you going to help? No. So mm -hmm. no, like, no, no, sorry, we're not helping the disabled. Like, uh, you know, you can, you know, in other words, what, let's say saying you can eat cake. You know, some people say eat cake, right? right? Well, I mean, people are suffering, right? They're suffering on, <laughs> on rates that are well below 50. I, you know, the stats used to say 40, 50%. I say because of inflation, cost of living, 60%, 70% below Going the up. poverty line. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't like to always put a number on it, like a, they'd say how many people are in subsidized housing, you know, so I don't even go there on that because right. it, the number is just way off. So with, with uh, just to kind of give an overview about the Canada Disability Benefit, it's an empty bill. I, I, I talk about this a lot on my podcast. Uh, and so and Neil will probably start laughing and other ones will. The pot of spaghetti. I talk to the, the pot of spaghetti. Well, you know, you asked me to, to make spaghetti. I said, oh, okay, well, here, I poured the water in. It's boiling. That's all you asked me to do. So I walk away. No, Brent, you, you, you said I asked you to make spaghetti. Oh, well, <laughs> you just boil the water. That's it, right? right? So where's all the ingredients? Where's yeah. all the ingredients? Well, I don't know. I haven't figured it out yet. Well, why not? Mm -hmm. You've had 903 days to figure it out. Actually, technically, they've had since 2015 to figure it out. The federal government's been in power. So, you know, they called an election. That bill, uh, it was actually a bill that was actually supposed to go through. Um, it got announced, and then they, they called an election. That bill died. So now they relaunched the bill, the same bill, but empty. And now we're a bit, you know, so now it's still sitting there. The um, uh, consultations with premiers across the country, the uh, federal minister, supposedly all these conversations, but nothing's been done. So now the question is, who is it going to go to? How much is it going to be? Is it going to have clawbacks? Well, some of these amendments have been put in place, which is great. And I, I applaud the, the MPs and a lot of the, uh, the people on the committee who have pushed really hard to make it happen, to accomplish that. And I've had other guests on uh, who are involved with that process. And so I applaud them for, for all the hard advocacy that they've done. They're trying to make it better. However, it still, there's no, there's no time frame of getting this out. Like they want to study it. It's now going through uh, Senate, which is great. It made its way to yeah. Senate. Still, it's now in the second reading and now it has to go back to committee again. And then it goes back yeah. to the third reading and then the Royal Assent. Well, if they call an election, if they call a federal election before it reaches royal assent, mm. oh boy, mm -hmm. you know, that's, uh, so I think what they want to do is push it through, but wait, but wait a minute, they push it through this empty bill, they call an election, well then, then what? Yeah. So the fact is people are in limbo, right? Um, in my view, as an overview of this, um, it's going to take a long time to get that money out to people. Right. Now, but my worry is I've just been doing a lot of research on it lately is I'm worried that they're going to go with a um, with an old stats, uh, a LICO formula of $19,000 per year. Now, the actual LICO formula for 2021 is $26,400. So that's the poverty, they call it the poverty line. It sounds like they might go with 19000 Now that's way back dated in, I think, 2017, 18-ish around. If they go with that, that will be kind of geared toward the OAS and GIS for seniors. Now that's not going to lift people out of poverty. That's going to keep right. them compressed down, but they're going to tie it to inflation. Well, really? Well, why not just go with the current one? Yeah. And tie inflation. You know what I mean? I think basic income. Now that's a whole ball game in itself. That's mm -hmm. down the road. However, they could put some kind of form of, of basic income in the meantime, where it's right. going to go automatically. Everybody, they don't have to apply or, do I, am I eligible? Is it going to go to people over 65? Because they still got disabilities. And how they, yeah. the talk is right now is that if they get this bill going, it's not including anyone over 65, but you just magically, right. it disappears, right? So yeah, I'll get Neil's take on on your, your view on that too, Neil. Like, what have you been hearing or what's your view on it? And then, then we'll go yeah, back I, to that. I know we're uh, right up against your clock there, Viv, because I'll be really, yeah. really no quick. Um, 
but one of the things I wanted to say is, uh, you know, when it comes to this whole uh, Canada's disability benefit, one of the things that I'm really watching carefully is I really wonder how the all the provincial governments are going to play nice with the federal government. Like, how is that going to coalesce? How are they mm -hmm. going to? Because the, the provincial yeah. government's not, 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 not just going to walk away and say, you know what, it's fine. We'll turn over all our social assistance stuff to you guys, yeah. and it's, it's yeah. fine. They're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. So the provincial governments and the federal government have to do this, and somehow they have to play nice together. And, and <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how that's going to work. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I, yeah, I really don't know how that's going to work. And my 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 final comment, and then I'm going to turn over for for you to, for final comments is, uh, you know this, uh, you know when when I was talking to you on the phone uh, last week or whatever, I was telling you that uh, when it comes to um, disability advocacy, it's kind of <laughs> like we're fighting uh, an 800 pound gorilla. Mm -hmm. or actually several 800, 800 pound yeah. girls and we're all fighting against each other rather right. than being united and like i i look at the single mothers alliance and you were able to unite under one cause one yep. thing and that's the difference between uh your organization you're able to like unite and be together whereas in the disability community everybody's so fragmented because everybody's so poor and pissed off like we're, we're all struggling in poverty. So you have um, advocacy groups that are fighting with, with one another, another saying, why, why are you advocating for this? If you're, not, if you're not advocating for the CRPD, which is the, uh, which is the convention for people with disabilities, the, the UN mm -hmm. char charter one, um, then you're not advocating. You might as well, you might as well go home. You're not, mm -hmm. you're not advocating. Or, or if, let's say if you're not advocating for the Canada, the Canada disability benefit, you might, go home you're not advocating if you're not advocating for this don't go home you're not advocating and so we all have targets on our backs like if you don't advocate in a certain way that we have you have other advocates out there that are deliberately trying to undermine others and take you down and right. say you're useless yeah. go away stop talking you're not you don't you don't agree with what i align with and it's because we're all fragmented we're all pissed off we're all in poverty and there's yeah. not that there's not that unity because nobody wants to unify under disability it seems like everybody's you know no, nobody wants to do that which is which is yeah. unfortunate but that's the that's the reality i think you know that that makes me think about you know, this is an organizing challenge and i can't speak to what you're referring to neil within the disability movement particularly but i'll speak from my own organizing context which includes mm -hmm. many who are who are living on disability, which is, you know, I think and, and being also involved in working for the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition, where it's always, you know, there's this risk, right, of this divide and conquer winning that mm -hmm. those who don't believe in the social spending that we want, who aren't on the side of the human rights vision that we have. This sort of, you know, okay, well, we're going to give this little bit to this one equity seeking group, but this equity seeking group gets nothing. And then what happens, I feel, and I used to talk, yes. we used to talk about this all the time, is different equity seeking groups are then pitted against each other. Mm -hmm. Right. right? Um, and then it's war and this sort of divide and conquer. So I feel like as an organizer, a community organizer, our role is to always, you know, develop our our skills and our best practice is so hard. It's so hard mm. to get on the same page and people might jump off and say, no, I'm not on that page and I'm not gonna organize on that page. And that's mm. sometimes okay. But I feel that just when you were speaking, Neil, I was thinking, I was feeling motivated. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I know. But then we have to mobilize. We still have to always yeah. work on that mobilizing yeah. and coming together in the allyship too. But I was thinking ultimately, you know what you were saying, Brent, like the Canada yeah. disability benefit and the long, long trajectory there, which is extremely frustrating and ridiculous. But in the meantime, so I was thinking, you know, of obviously working towards pushing for that bigger vision, that better system. But in the meantime, let's end more clawbacks in British Columbia, because yeah. people are yeah. right now today living on these incomes, you know, really punished by these unnecessary clawbacks. I think the one you're talking about is winnable. I, mean, I feel like I'm yeah, like, let's go. Let's it's, go. Yeah. Like, it, let's should yeah. it should be winnable. Yeah. It should be winnable. Let's go again. Yeah. Let's well, do it again. Well, 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 you well, know we what we did you know, in 2014. Let's do it again. And some more of these things now. It's like, it's like yeah. all these high market rents. It's like uh, $500. Well, the landlords look at that and they go, what the heck? You know, and 
I even talked to my landlord and, you know, and I live in a REIT, like I, I pay market rent. Right. And so, you know, I asked on, on a personal level, I said like, yeah, 125 she goes, yeah, you don't get that until July. So I went to the ministry's office and I, you know, I, cause I, I'm, I'm on disability just like me, Owen, and so many uh, hundreds over hundreds of thousands of others. So I asked, you know, and, and my, my roommate at the time, uh, went there too and asked, said, well, when are you going to give this money? I, are you going to give it sooner? And that's not going to happen. That's no, <laughs> they're not going to do that. They're going to make you wait until July. Yeah. You know, Ridiculous. wait until July. Like, uh, so anyway, I asked my manager, I said, well, that 125, I mean, how are you going to rent uh, at market housing? Like even higher. She says, that's going to be impossible. Like, Landlords are going to look at it and say, well, we don't want you using support to basically pay high market rent, right? So it's discrimination. And is really, like she said, it's not hard. It's really not difficult to raise the rates right up. Like it's just, it's all a political theater is what it is really at the end of the day. But she says, keep advocating for change. Keep, you know, pushing, standing up for what you believe in your rights. And I thought, well, wow. We have, you know, the provincial election, October, 2024, so yeah. mm. we've got a nice yeah. nice runway up until then to to yeah. to to get some really key reforms in the yeah. in the platforms of 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 all parties and um and I think you know count the single mothers alliance in for any and all allyship organizing campaigning mobilizing because I feel that um you know mm. we can't keep we got to we can't let the the flame you know turn down yeah, um, we, we just keep mowing forward, right? And and, and uh, join as allies and uh, conquer all these conquer. inequalities. Yeah. And end yeah. the clawbacks. Let's end more clawbacks. Yeah. Have to end well, the sign oh. me up. Sign me up, Vivica. Let's, uh, let's, <laughs> let's join forces again. Yeah, let's, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, but we've I'm we've uh, reached the end of our time. So yeah. let's well, uh, wrap I, up I, now. I want to thank you very much, Vivica, for coming on today. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you both, Brent and Neil, so much. I feel really um, inspired and invigorated. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about the history of the of clawback organizing. And I've learned a lot today. So yeah. thank you so much. I, I've That's learned good. a lot today too from you. And uh, advocacy never takes a never takes a break. It's, uh, it's uh, you know it's full full steam ahead, and we will get this uh, conquered for sure. There's so many right. things to do. And thank you again. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, both. Vivica. All yeah. right. Take thank care. You. Thanks. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.